Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. You're probably all familiar with this verse that says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, does Jesus mean that literally or metaphorically, or can we interpret eye of the needle as something else, perhaps a small doorway? Or is the word that's actually used there not camel, but rope? Now, these are questions that sometimes arise when we're talking about this difficult passage. There are some who want to soften the impact of these hard words of Jesus by reinterpreting what he's talking about. So is it true? Can the eye of a needle actually refer to a small door in a gateway? Well, we're going to answer that question as we work our way through this text. We're looking at Mark chapter 10, and we're going to look at the surrounding context as well. Now, this follows from what we covered in last week's video, where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and wants to be one of his followers. And when Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions and give it to the poor and then come follow him, the man walks away disheartened, depressed, sad, because he had great wealth. So we're going to see what Jesus, how Jesus follows that up, that conversation with the rich young ruler, how he follows that with this conversation with his disciples. And we're going to see how the words of Jesus were just as shocking to them as they are to us. One of the things I think it's important to keep in mind is that sometimes we think that, oh, what Jesus said in the first century would not have been nearly as, as troublesome as it is today. Not true. Many of the things that Jesus taught were just as in your face as then as they are now. They were just as counterintuitive and countercultural then as they are now. And we'll see that in this particular section because the disciples who had been walking with Jesus and learning from Jesus for some time now, when they heard Jesus say this about riches, they were astonished. They were amazed. In other words, they didn't see it coming. What Jesus said was contrary to the cultural and religious assumptions of their day, just like they're contrary to the assumptions and the counter, the, the, the cultural affirmations of our particular day. So let's begin by looking at how this section starts out. This is verses 23 and 24 of Mark chapter 10. So this is after, immediately after, the rich young ruler walks away, the one who had great possessions. So no more does he walk away before Jesus looks around and he says to his disciples, how difficult it is, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Now, if you look in this section it's in its entirety, in verses 22, 23, and 25, you've got three different Greek words or phrases that refer to possessions or riches. There's no great difference between these. Verse 22 describes the rich young ruler as one who had great possessions. Verse 23 describes wealth. That's the verse we just looked at. And then in a minute, we're going to have reference to a rich person, plusion, and that's in verse 25. Again, no great difference between these three. They're just three different ways of expressing someone who has is a person of affluence. Secondly, they were astonished. So they were thombeot in Greek. Now, this particular word is used two different times in the Gospels. We have it here in verse 24, but it's also used in chapter 1, verse 27. They were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So the astonishment or amazement at the teaching and the power and authority of Jesus is remarked upon in verse 27 of chapter 1. And then if you move a few verses after the text we're looking at today, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were thombeo. They were amazed. Why were they amazed? because Jesus was moving into the city of suffering and death, and they were, uh, they were thombeo, they were astonished that he was doing what he was doing. And now, here, they're astonished at his words about riches in the kingdom of God. One question that you might be asking yourselves is, why? What was it about what Jesus said concerning riches and the kingdom of God that astonished his disciples? Evidently, this was contrary to what they thought he would say, or contrary to what they assumed was true. Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you do find a number of passages which talk about how material blessings are a gift of God. And, you, of course, you have many very powerful, rich, holy men of the Old Testament, people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob 
and David and many others. These were people who had authority, they had power, they had great wealth and possessions, and they were the followers of the Lord. And you have passages which suggest that God is going to look with favor materially upon some of his people. For instance, if you go to Psalm 112, you read this, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Wealth and riches are in his house. Or you go to Proverbs 14, and you read that the crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. And this comment by commentator R.T. France, who's one that I frequently refer to, his commentary in the Gospel of Mark is very helpful, and he says, in Jewish society, it was generally taken for granted that wealth was to be welcomed as a mark of God's blessing. Rabbis like Hillel and Akiba, those are rabbis that are roughly contemporary with Jesus, although Akiba is a little bit later. Rabbis like Hillel and Akiba, who rose from obscurity and poverty to wealth and influence, are commended without embarrassment. Now, of course, this isn't the entire story. We have examples from the Old Testament prophets where they preached about trusting in riches, and they, they condemned those who did that. They talked about those who had the wealth and the ability to help the poor, and yet they did not. In fact, they often tread them underfoot. So there's plenty of Old Testament passages that warn about trusting in wealth and riches, but there's also passages which indicate that these are gifts of God. And it was kind of the, the common assumption in the first century Jewish culture, as it really is the common assumption in our own culture, that those who are well-off materially are blessed by God, as opposed to those who are not well-off materially are not blessed by God. It's not true, but that is a common assumption that people make. Now, the disciples were amazed that Jesus said what he did because they bought into this idea. They bought into the idea that if you are well-off materially, then you've got a pretty good chance of making it. You got a pretty good chance of entering the kingdom of God because just think of all the things that you can do with this wealth, all these good works that you could do with this particular wealth. So that's why they are amazed. And as we're going to see in just a second, they're even more amazed as Jesus continues to flesh out this teaching on riches in the kingdom of God. But next we have to get to this particular image of a camel and the eye of a needle. And this is verses 24 and 25. But Jesus said to them again, children, that's a common term of endearment for his disciples, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, as I said, there's a couple of different ways that this has been reinterpreted, and the hardness of this particular saying has been softened. One of these is this. So there are a small number, and I mean a very small number, of Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, where instead of having the word kamelon, which is translated here as camel, there's been one letter altered so that it's kamelon. So I, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but I've put in blue the change of letters. It's just one, one letter difference between camel and this kamelon, which means rope. So instead of it speaking of a camel going through the eye of a needle, it speaks of a rope going through the eye of a needle, which admittedly is so preposterous, just not as preposterous as the image of a camel trying to fit through this. But you can see how through the alteration of that one particular letter, there was a softening, an attempted softening of this hard saying. But by far the more common way of reinterpreting this and trying to, to make it seem as if it's not an impossibility, but a faint possibility is this. Now, I've taken this particular image and quote from a very popular website that is known as Lightstock. Uh, often churches and other Christian organizations get images from, from Lightstock, as, as I do myself sometimes. But I found this one and the explanation as an example of how this reinterpretation goes. So, quote, what Jesus was referring to when he talked about the eye of the needle was a small door that was used to enter the city of Jerusalem. This was a small doorway inside a larger gate entrance where a camel could only walk through with great difficulty, squeezed through on its knees, and have all its contents unpacked, including the rider and any carry-on items. It took great effort and was no doubt a humbling experience, which is why 
Jesus used this example. So what do we think about this? That's what we think about it. No, absolutely not. It's all made up. If you ever hear this explanation, just know that it's an urban legend or it's a, it's a church legend or, or uh, uh, an interpretive legend, whatever you want to think of it. It's, it is not the case that when Jesus refers to a camel going through the eye of a needle, he's referring to a camel going through this small door inside a larger gate area. This falsehood was popularized in the 1800s. It became, became common to hear this in sermons, and maybe you've heard it yourself. It first appeared in the 9th century, and that was, of course, long after Jerusalem of Jesus' day had been destroyed. And we don't have a shred of evidence, not a shred of evidence, that I, as an eye of a needle, ever meant little door or small door in the gate. The reason Jesus chose the eye of a needle, of course, smallness, and the camel is because the camel was the largest animal in Palestine. So it made perfect sense as the choice for this metaphor that's all about impossibility. And that really is the point. Jesus isn't saying it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, kingdom of God. He's not saying that it's, you know, with, it takes great effort and a lot of sacrifice and humility for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. His point is that it's impossible, period. His point is that it's just as impossible for that to happen as for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. We also have, by the way, rabbinic evidence of this particular image being used. Now, this is much later than the New Testament. This is from the, the Jewish Talmud, so this is three or four centuries after the teaching of Jesus. But we do have this parallel, and it's talking about the interpretation and the meaning of dreams. So if you look at the bold part, it says, Know that this is the case, for one is neither shown a golden palm tree nor an elephant going through the eye of a needle in a dream. In other words, dreams only contain images that enter a person's mind. Their point there is that, and I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, because I've had, I've had some wild dreams myself where uh, unnatural type things happen. But that's the point of this particular part of, the tar, part of the Talmud, is that when you're dreaming, dreams only contain things that can actually be possible, not like uh, an elephant going through the eye of a needle. The point of the parallel is that that particular message was the same thing that was communicated in the Talmud as Jesus was communicating. So when Jesus is talking about a camel, he's talking about a camel. When he's talking about the eye of a needle, he's talking about the eye of a needle. Camel can't go through the eye of a needle. Rich man can't enter the kingdom of God. Or can he? Well, let's see how this goes on. So Mark 10, 26, 27 records another Another episode of astonishment on the part of the disciples. If they were amazed before, now they are exceedingly astonished. We'll look at that word in Greek in just a minute. They were exceedingly astonished. And they said to him, well, then who can be saved? I mean, if, if a rich man can't be saved, if a guy who has all these possessions, and they're thinking, of course, of a, of a Jewish believer in the first century, and they're not thinking of rich Gentiles, they're thinking of rich, rich fellow Jewish believers who were able to, to do great things for the poor, to contribute all this money, to do all these wonderful things for, for the kingdom. If, if that person can't be saved, well, then who has a chance? Who can be saved? Jesus looked, the Greek verb there is in blepo. That's the same verb, by the way, that we looked at last week when Jesus looked at and loved the rich young ruler. And I pointed out in that video that it's, it's more of just kind of a glance. It's, like, it's a deeper, intense look. So Jesus in blepo, he looked at them intensely and said, and these are, these are the words we've all been leading up to, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, not with God. For all things are possible with God. Now, first of all, let's look at this word for amazed, which is ekpleso. It's used a few different times, but a couple different times in Mark's gospel with this superlative use, talking about something which is not just, you know, astonished or amazed, but uh, in, in, in a great ex to a great extent amazed. So if you go back to Mark 7, this is when Jesus heals the man who was deaf and, and mute. And what was the reaction of the people? They were astonished beyond measure. They were ekpleso. And they were ekpleso beyond measure. Huper perisos is the, is the adverb that's used there for beyond measure. 
And they said, he's done all things well. So they were amazed in Mark 7 at his, it is miraculous working power. Now, this same kind of amazement greets us in Mark chapter 10. They were exceedingly astonished. We have the kind of that, the same form of that, uh, that adverb that's used, perisos. They were exceedingly astonished. And they said, of course, who then can be saved? Now, Jesus has set them all up for this. He's taken someone that they assumed had it made. I mean, no question, of course this person can enter the kingdom of God. Of course they can be saved. I mean, who would dare question that? And then Jesus comes along, and he doesn't just question it, but he turns it completely completely backwards and says, oh, no, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are nonplussed, and they, they say, well, then, who has a chance? And that's exactly the point that Jesus is getting to. Nobody. With man, this is impossible. There is no salvation in you, no salvation in me, no salvation in a rich man, so no salvation in a poor man. When it comes to being saved, we are without hope if we're focused upon people, if we're focused upon me and you and how much money we have or don't have or how many good works we've done or how much sin we would have, we would have avoided. As long as we're talking about me, 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 then we are without hope in this world. Nobody can be saved absolutely nobody. And then Jesus, once he said these words, I can almost sense there's sort of a, a pause and a twinkle in his eye in which, and then he goes on, he says, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. So Jesus shifts from this focus upon us to a focus upon himself and his father. A shift from a focus upon how much money we have or don't have, or how much good we've done, or how much evil we've avoided, or whatever it is, it's all about me, me, me. And he focuses instead upon the one who can actually bring salvation, the one who gives eternal life, the one who brings us into the kingdom. With God, all things are possible. And then, he, as he does this, he's actually alluding to several different passages in the Old Testament where we have this same kind of language that is used. For instance, if you go back to Genesis 18, this is when God had promised Abraham and Sarah they would have a child. Of course, they're both like 190 years old. And God says to them, is the word impossible with God? So is, this, is, is, is me giving a child to this woman who is well, well past the childbearing years, is this, is this possible? Well, of course it is, because is, the, is anything, is the word impossible with God? Or if you go to Job chapter 42, this is, you know, at the, toward the end of Job after God has begun to speak to him. And Job says to the Lord, I know that you're able to do all things and nothing is impossible with you. And then finally, Zechariah chapter eight, which is where God is, through the prophet is talking about all these blessings which he's going to bring to his people in the future. And we have this in verse six. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Whether it seems impossible before the remnant of this people in those days, should it seem impossible even to me, says the Lord Almighty? So when Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible, he has taken us into this deep rootedness in the Old Testament in which the God of possibility, the God who gives life in Sarah's womb, the God who gives life to his people in Jerusalem, the God who is going to restore the fortunes of Job, this same God now stands before his disciples and us and says, oh, don't you worry about that, because with God all things are possible. He is the giver of salvation. He is the Savior, and we are those who are saved. We are those who receive it, and that's why it's a gift. It's not an acquisition. It's not something that we earn. It is a gift that God gives to us. With God, all things are not only possible, but we have a God here who desires us to be saved, a God who's done everything necessary to save us in Jesus Christ. So that is the shocking, astonishing good news that Jesus finishes this with. Now we'll see in just a couple more minutes here how Peter responds. So Peter, having listened to all of this, then wants to ask a question or make a statement. And he says this, so having observed all this and seen how Jesus handled his interaction with the rich young ruler who went away sad, now Peter says to Jesus, uh, Lord, 
we've left everything and followed you. So P- Peter, as it were, wants to point out, hey, we're not like the rich young ruler. We, we left everything and we followed you. We're, we're of your followers. And Jesus, wanting to comfort and console Peter, says more or less, I know. I know that you have. And here's what I'm going to do for you. Truly, I say to you, there was no one, not just you, Peter, but there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, so now in this age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, now he throws that in, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. I want you to look on the screen here and notice one thing that's left out in the corresponding list on the right. So Jesus talks about a person who's left a house, and so he's also now now going to receive houses. He's left brothers, he's going to receive more brothers. He's left sisters, he's going to receive more sisters. He's left his mother, he's going to receive more mothers. But one thing that's left out is father. It doesn't say he will receive now a hundredfold fathers. Why? Because we only have one heavenly father. We have one father, our father who art in heaven, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why in that second list, it's left out. And then you have the one who's left these things for my sake and for the gospel. That one will also receive persecutions because that's the way it is in this world. So what Jesus is wanting to do is wanting to affirm to Peter, who speaks as it were for all the disciples, saying, listen, I know that you've left everything and followed me. I know that that's what it means to be a disciple. And rest assured that you're going to receive, as a result of being my disciple, a much bigger family. This is the way that Jesus is talking about our life in the community of the church, in which we look around and now we have all these brothers. Now we have all these sisters. Now we have this extended family. This is the way that Jesus is describing to us what the kingdom of God as the church is going to look like. As we become a follower of Jesus, we're not alone. Instead, now we're surrounded by all these other people who also believe with us, the family of God, the body of Christ. So this is Jesus' way of assuring Peter that when he follows Jesus, he doesn't follow him, as it were, as a solitary individual, but he's surrounded by all of these blessings of God that take the form of the kingdom of God, of the church. Now, let me just wrap up with this image that we have seen actually twice before in these videos. This is the structure of this part of Mark's gospel. So what we've been looking at the past three weeks are the teachings of Jesus couched between two passion predictions. So the passion prediction of Mark 9, 30 through 32, and the passion prediction that follows immediately after this text we looked at in this video. And here we have all these teachings about like how children are model disciples and the radical measures to stop sinning, like cutting off hands and feet. We looked at marriage and divorce and what Jesus said there. And now today and last week, we looked at riches, riches and the treasures in heaven. Now, structurally, these begin with Jesus talking about how anyone who would be first, let him be last of all and servant of all. That's 935. And now, perfectly in conformity with the structure here, we're going to wrap up with Chapter 10, verse 31, which says, Many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is a kind of a proverbial way of Jesus summing up everything he's been saying here, saying that everything that the world teaches you is true is most likely going to be turned on its head by what I teach you, because I am not of this world. I came down from heaven in order to reveal to you the truth, a truth in the world that's darkened by lies, a truth in a world that has everything backwards. I come to set things straight. It seems like I'm turning everything upside down, but I'm actually turning everything right side up. I'm giving you eyes whereby you can see the world as the Father sees it. I'm giving you ears whereby you can hear the world as as the Father hears it. And this has just kind of not kind of esoteric or, or philosophical or theological ramifications. It has real-life ramifications for how we deal with sin, how we deal with, with riches, how we deal with marriage and divorce and remarriage. This has real-life implications because the life of a disciple is hearing and believing and then having the Spirit conform our lives so they are in conformity with the good life that God desires for each of us. Well, now I hope that you understand what the eye of a needle and the camels are all about. And 
most importantly, that you understand what Jesus is saying when he talks about how these things are possible with God. We can't save ourselves. A rich man can't, a poor man can't. Our hope, in fact, our assurance is based solely upon one thing and one thing only, and it's not a thing, it's a person. It's our Lord Jesus Christ, who not only is able to save us, but has gone all the way to the cross and out of the empty tomb to make sure that we are saved in him. Thanks be to God for that gift. I pray that you're all doing well, and I pray that God's peace may overflow to each of you. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.